Welcome back, everyone, to another deep dive. Today, um, well, this one might surprise you. We're talking grizzly bears, but through the lens of, well, something a lot smaller, red squirrels. Yeah. It's a fascinating yeah. connection, really. Uh, we'll be looking at a research paper published in Environmental Management and Sustainable Development. The title's a mouthful. It's called Red Squirrel, Tamiasurus hudsonicus, Midden Site Selection, and Conifer Species Composition. Wow. Okay, so I guess our mission today is to figure out how these little squirrels, red squirrels, I mean, how they fit into the bigger picture for grizzlies. That's exactly it. And why forest managers, well, they need to be paying attention to these squirrels, maybe more than you'd think. Right. So start us off. What's so important about these red squirrels to the bears? Well, it all starts with a tree, actually, the white bark pine. Okay. These trees, they're like, uh, I guess you could say energy bars for the grizzlies, especially before winter hits. Like they fatten up on them. Exactly. It's all about getting ready for that long sleep. Makes sense. So where do these trees grow? Are we talking like all over the place? Well, the research, the one we're looking at, that takes place in the Cook City Basin, Montana. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that, near Yellowstone. Right near it. And this basin, it's got a pretty healthy population of white bark pine. For now. For now? What, what do you mean? Well, sadly, white bark pine, they're facing some pretty serious threats these days. Like what? You've got mountain pine beetles, those are a big one, and then you've got this thing called blister rust. It's a disease. Yeah. Kind of a double whammy for the trees. Oh, wow. So forest managers are, well, they're trying different things to help the trees out, like thinning them, sometimes doing controlled burns, mm -hmm. trying to give the white bark pine a fighting chance. Right, right. So back to those squirrels, how do they fit into all of this? Yeah, so red squirrels, yeah. these guys are busy. They spend all day gathering white bark pine cones. <laughs> they store them underground in these little... Uh, I guess you could call them pantries. They're called middens. Like little squirrel bunkers. Yeah, pretty much. They're organized, too. You can almost picture them, you know, neatly stacking all the cones. So they're like little hoarders, cute but hoarders. Exactly. But here's the thing. That's where the grizzlies come in. They Well, they raid these middens. No way. Yeah. They get most of their white bark pine seeds that way. Over 90% of them, actually, come from stealing from these squirrel stashes. Wow, that's that's kind of funny. But also, that means if the squirrels aren't around... The bears are in trouble. Exactly. And that's what got the researchers thinking. If they wanted to understand how much food grizzlies would have, they needed to figure out, like, what makes a squirrel choose a spot for their midden? Makes sense. How'd they go about doing that, tracking squirrels around the forest? Well, kind of. They surveyed, like, over 800 different spots, plots in the forest, really looked at every detail, what kind of trees were there, how much sun reached the ground, like a full-on squirrel habitat investigation. Okay, so what did they find? What's like a red squirrel's dream home? Well, it turns out they're not as into white bark pine as you might think. I mean, they like it, but they prefer a mix, a mixed conifer forest. Like with other trees too. Yeah, so you've got your white bark pine, of course, but also subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce. That's their ideal combo. Huh. Why not just, you know, stick close to the white bark pine? Isn't that their main food source? Well, it's not just about the food. Think about it. Those white bark pines, they tend to grow in these, like, exposed areas. Higher up, not a lot of cover. So not exactly squirrel friendly. Yeah, I mean, imagine you're a squirrel constantly exposed to the elements, predators everywhere. Mm -hmm. You'd want some shelter, right? Makes sense. Plus, those fir and spruce trees, they offer a bit more of a consistent food source, you know, when the white bark pine cones aren't as plentiful. So it's like, it's good to have options, not put all your eggs in one basket, right? Exactly. And that that's where things get really interesting, especially when you think about the bears mm. and the people trying to manage the forests for everyone's benefit. So we've got our picky squirrels building these middens the bears need, but then we've got the forest managers trying to help the white bark pine, which... Well, it sounds like it could kind of mess things up for everyone. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tricky situation. Remember, we talked about thinning and burning the forests. Well, in the long term, that's good for the white bark pine. Gives them more space, more resources to grow. But. But. <laughs> there's always a but, right? It takes like decades for those new white bark pines to start producing cones, like a really long time. And while that's happening, all that thinning and burning, it reduces the number of those other trees, the fir and spruce. The ones the squirrels need for their perfect mix. Exactly. So you're trying to help the white bark pine, but you could be hurting the squirrels mm -hmm. and in turn hurting the bears that rely on them. Kind of a uh, 
a vicious cycle. It sounds like a real dilemma for the forest managers. Like, how do they make the right choices here? That's where this research, it becomes really important. Remember those middens the researchers mapped out? Yeah. Those are like, I guess you could say a guide for the forest managers, like a treasure map showing them where those really important spots are for both the squirrels and the bears. So more middens equals more important. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. The more middens, the more you know that's a prime spot. Yeah. A squirrel hot spot, and likely lots of bears are relying on it too. So what do they do? Just avoid those areas altogether? Well, sometimes. Or if they have to do some work there, like thinning or burning, mm -hmm. they can at least do it carefully, make sure they're leaving enough of the other trees the squirrels need. So it's like a balancing act, trying to help the white bark pine for the future, but also protect what the squirrels and bears need right now. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And those middens, those little squirrel stashes. They're like the key to getting that balance right. It's wild to think that these little squirrel piles are so important for the whole ecosystem, like a tiny clue that unlocks this whole bigger picture. It really shows you how everything's connected, you know? Sometimes the smallest things can have the biggest impact. And understanding those connections, well, that's the key to managing these forests in a way that works for everyone. We've already talked about so much these threats to the white bark pine, those picky squirrels, but there's still this big one looming out there, right? Climate change. I mean, how does that fit into all of this? How do we make sure these species, the squirrels, the bears, the trees, how do we make sure they have a chance in a world that's, well, changing pretty fast? That That is the million dollar question, isn't it? It means we have to, uh, well, change the way we think about things. Instead of trying to control nature, we have to help it adapt, help it be resilient. So instead of trying to create the perfect forest, Mm -hmm. We need to embrace the uh, the messiness a bit. Exactly. The more diversity you have, the more resilient that forest is. Mm -hmm. Different species, different ages of trees. Mm -hmm. That helps it cope with disturbances, whether it's disease, fire, or, yeah, even climate change. Yeah. A diverse forest can bounce back better. It's like having a, a, a backup plan or a bunch of them. Exactly. And that leads us to some, well, some pretty interesting solutions that researchers are looking into. One of them is called assisted migration. Okay. What's that? It sounds kind of sci-fi, but basically it's taking white bark pine seeds from areas with warmer climates and planting them higher up in areas that might get warmer in the future, giving them a head start, so to speak. Kind of like helping them move along with the changing climate. Yeah, exactly. Another approach, well, it focuses on protecting the good spots that already exist. Those areas where the squirrels and bears are doing well. So making sure those spots don't get messed up. Yeah. Managing them carefully. Mm -hmm. Maybe using fire in a controlled way. Keeping out invasive species. Minimizing any disturbance from humans. So it's like protecting those little islands of wilderness that are doing okay so they can act as, I don't know, like safe havens for the future. Exactly. And, and one thing we can't forget is the human element. We need to teach people about this, about how important these species are and how delicate this whole balance is. So we all have a part to play. Exactly. Whether you live in the mountains or not, what happens to these forests, to the grizzlies, the squirrels, the trees, it affects all of us. Mm. We're all connected. That's a good point. And, you know, hearing about all these potential solutions, it does give me some hope. It sounds like there are a lot of people working really hard to make sure these species have a future. It shows you what we can do when we put our minds to it, our ingenuity, and, well, realizing how important it is to protect these places. Even when things seem really challenging, there's always hope. That's a great point to end on. So listeners, as you go about your day, think about those red squirrels and grizzly bears, how their lives are tied to the health of our forests, and how that ultimately affects us all. And keep asking questions, stay curious, and use your voice to speak up for these places, for these species because we all have a role to play in making sure they have a chance. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of red squirrels, grizzly bears, and, well, all the challenges and maybe the hope that comes with conservation in a changing world. We'll see you next time for another adventure. Okay, so we've talked about these white bark pines, these super picky squirrels, and how forest managers are using those middens to, like, guide their decisions. Yeah. But, you know, we haven't really touched on that big looming question, right? Climate change. Right. I mean, how does that fit in? How do we make sure these species, all of them, have a chance in a world that's, well, changing pretty fast? That's the uh, that's the big one, isn't it? It means, well, we got to change the way we think about things. What do you mean? Instead of trying to control nature like we have been, we need to help it adapt. Okay. Help it be more resilient. 
Because we can't just stop climate change overnight, right? Right. So what, we just let things happen, let the forest do its thing? Not exactly. Think of it like this. Um, a forest that has a lot of variety, different tree species, different ages of trees, that kind of forest is a lot tougher. Yeah, it can handle, well, disturbances better. Like if a disease hits or a fire, even climate change. A more diverse forest is going to bounce back better. It's like having a, a safety net. Right. Right. More yeah. options. So if one thing fails. Yeah, exactly. Then... And that leads to some pretty interesting ideas people are working on. One of them is, uh, it's called assisted migration. Assisted migration? What's that? Like moving the trees around? Well, kind of. It sounds a little out there, but basically yeah. it's taking seeds, white bark pine seeds, from places that are already warmer uh -huh. and planting those seeds higher up in places that might get warmer because of climate change, mm -hmm. giving them a, well, a head start. Like helping them migrate along with the changing climate. Exactly. And then there's another approach, which is more about protecting those really good spots that already exist. You know, the areas where the squirrels and bears are doing well now. Yeah. Those spots, they need extra care. Maybe managing fire really carefully, making sure invasive species don't take over. Yeah. And of course, minimizing how much we humans are disturbing those areas. So protect the good spots we've got so they can be like strongholds for the future. Exactly. And there's one more thing we can't forget. It's the, uh, well, it's the human element. Okay. We need to be educating people, you know, de teaching everyone how important these species are and how, how delicate this whole balance is in the forest. So it's not just on the scientists and the forest managers. No, not at all. It's on everyone. Whether you live right next to a forest or in a city miles away, what happens to those forests, it affects us all. That's true. And, you know, hearing about these different solutions, it does it does make me feel a little more hopeful. Like there are people out there who are really trying to make a difference. Yeah, there are. It's pretty amazing what we can do when we put our minds to it, you know, yeah. and when we realize, hey, these places are important. They're worth protecting. Even when things seem, you know, really tough, there's always that that spark of hope. That's a that's a great way to put it. So listeners, as you go about your day to day, think about those red squirrels, those grizzly bears. Think about how much their lives depend on healthy forests and how those forests ultimately, well, they affect all of us. So keep asking questions, stay curious about the world around you, and most importantly, use your voice. Yeah, speak up for these places, for these amazing creatures, because we all have a role to play in making sure they have a fighting chance. That's it for this deep dive into the world of red squirrels, grizzly bears, and the future of our forests. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time for another adventure.